We had a rough start to the year down here in the basement, like I landed in hospital after some really bad pizza rough. But as we all know, great anime makes everything better. So long story short, Yazzie and I are about 50 episodes deep into King of the Hill now. But don't you worry, between all that bedridden binging, plus unwilling purging, I still found time to watch every single new anime of the new season in order to find the 10 that are most worth your time. These are the ones to watch for winter 2022. Brought to you one last time by me. More specifically, my U2's figurine, which is available to pre-order until February 3rd at noon PST at the link in the doobly-doo. The figure depicts me as the maitre d' of Chez Garbage, where we host our seasonal trash roasts, serving up a steaming hot plate of isekai for your enjoyment. As a passionate figure hoarder myself, I went back and forth with U2's for months to nail down a fun design that would look great from many angles and in any collection, but of course any collectible is gonna look best among its own kind, as you can plainly see when I put my me next to my spiffy new Super Eye Patch Wolf vinyl. And while that one is sadly no longer available, they are currently selling a really cute U2s of Chainsaw Man that I think makes a perfect pairing with my slightly bloodied work-dressed figure. So act quick if you want to own both. Now let's get on with that list. And let's start with one of my most anticipated anime of not just this year, but the last few, Trigun Stampede. As one of the holy trinity of Toonami space cowboys, the original Trigun holds a special place in the hearts of countless Gen X and millennial weebs, and now, thanks to the incredible talent and technology of Beastars Studio Orange, a whole new generation will have a chance to discover the bio-diesel punk wonders and horrors of planet Gunsmoke for themselves. Not to mention the inimitable charms of that goofball gunman with a heart of gold, the 60 billion double dollar man, Vash the Stampede. He's also called the Humanoid Typhoon for his purported ability to destroy entire cities single-handed, but as intrepid reporters Meryl Strife and Roberto De Niro quickly discover when they meet him hanging around a local landmark, the man himself bears little resemblance to his reputation. Far from a bloodthirsty killer, Vash can hardly stand the sight of the stuff. In a fun twist on classic Wild West action, this pacifistic pistolier only uses his unmatched aim to save lives, and most of the damage he gets blamed for is actually the fault of the countless desperados out for his bounty. Though that specific detail did matter a lot more to these reporters back when they were insurance agents named Meryl Strife and Millie Thompson in the original. Yeah, Orange has made quite a few huge changes to this story for their retelling, shuffling around and replacing characters and plot points to center it more firmly on Vash as a relatable protagonist rather than an enigmatic force of nature and source of corny jokes. This means that much of the mystery of the original has been lost in this new version, but in the quarter century since its debut, the cat has long been let out of the bag on pretty much every Trigun spoiler, so I'm actually pretty okay with that. The remixed plot gives longtime fans like me a chance to be legitimately surprised again, to see Trigun's world and characters from a whole new angle, or rather, dozens of new angles per minute thanks to all the breathtaking 3D animation, but let's not split hairs. It also means that new fans of this new show can go back to enjoy the classic story and gritty hand-painted aesthetic of the original without either version feeling redundant, and that's an ideal I think every remake should strive for. Of course, reboots and remakes aren't the only way that good anime stories get another go-round. It's the nature of industrialized entertainment that whenever a novel high concept takes off, it's only a matter of time until it's knocked off. Usually a matter of years, not the nine months it's been since Spy Family's explosive debut, but nonetheless, here Buddy Daddies is, and I am 
absolutely here for it. Even though it's very clearly the result of someone saying, man, the only way the ladies could love this manga more is if there were two Lloyds, and then another someone's eyes immediately turning into cartoon yen signs. It's not quite one-to-one, -one, obviously. That'd be boring. Rather than spies, these Lloyds, party animal Kazuki and gamer shut-in Ray, are professional assassins. And instead of those, uh, hair cone thingies? Their impossibly precocious accidentally adopted daughter wears goggles. But still, fundamentally speaking, Buddy Daddies does everything a Spy Family fan going through postseason withdrawals could possibly want. Over-the-top, family-friendly humor, cool, creative gunfights that give the animators endless opportunities to flex, and, of course, a top-tier gremlin. Just look at her! Our reaction gif folder overfloweth! Most importantly, though, Buddy Daddies has some real heart behind it to balance out all the comedy and action. Plus, just a smidge of darkness to make its upbeat vibes shine all the brighter by contrast. Which you might recall me calling out in my Spy Family video last year as THE key ingredient in the series' secret sauce. One that Buddy Daddies wields deftly to create something with its own distinct flavor that still absolutely hits that Anya-shaped spot. If you're looking for more good vibes to brighten up your winter, look no further than Tomo-chan is a girl, the tale of a teen tomboy who just wants her best karate pal Junichiro to finally look at her as a woman. Unfortunately, the affable, rough-around-the-edges himbo stubbornly refuses to see Tomo as anything less than his ride-or-die bosom buddy for life, which it's heavily implied he's only doing to stop himself from thinking about his buddy's bosom and making stuff all weird. But then, ironically, that causes him to think there's nothing weird about tickling her out of nowhere, so, you know, he gets hit a lot, and it's hard to blame her, honestly. Though, to be fair to Jun, a fair amount of blame does also lie with Tomo's other best friend, Misuzu, who is much, much smarter than the both of them combined, and thinks that toying with their feelings is absolutely hilarious. It is. She's my favorite. While Tomo-chan is just about the polar opposite of Sakura in every way you can imagine, the show that bears her name has a surprisingly similar vibe and sense of humor to Monthly Girls Nozaki-kun, one of the funniest rom-coms ever made, if you haven't seen it. Though, if you haven't, Fair warning, uh, don't expect too much in the way of romantic catharsis or closure here for at least a while. It's kind of a joke. But it's a very good joke if you give it the chance, and far from the only thing this anime has going for it. With an instantly lovable cast of characters and a knack for subverting expectations in genuinely clever ways, Tomo-chan is a girl is definitely the rom-com to beat this season. Which is mighty impressive considering its competition, and my next recommendation is a brand new jump adaptation, Kubo Won't Let Me Be Invisible. The story of a quiet loner with no friends and the pretty popular girl who gently prods him to come out of his shell. Yeah, uh, between teasing Master Takagi-san, Tonori no Seki-kun, Don't Bully Me Nagatoro-chan, and My Dress Up Darling, it can be hard to shake the feeling that you've seen this anime before, but the central joke of our hero, Junta Shiraishi, being such a nothing background character that most people literally can't see him and think of him as some sort of cryptid is novel and clever, and the series gets some really good mileage out of it, particularly in its visual gags, which really sing thanks to the manga's strong, simple character designs and Studio Pine Jam's characteristically fun, energetic animation. But of course, the real star of the show has her name in the title. Nagisa Kubo, played pitch perfectly by the legendary Kana Hanazawa, is one of the only people in the show's world who can see Junta when he's not calling attention to himself, and that suits her just fine, as she finds the world's reaction to his presence, or lack thereof, and his reactions to pretty much any kind of unexpected stimuli, really, to be endlessly entertaining, for reasons that utterly baffle our hero, and which our heroine is super coy about, yet which anyone past puberty will instantly suss out. <clears throat> 
She likes you, dummy! Between those shows, and a few more in the bargain bin at the end, this is a hell of a season for lovers of romance. But I think the real winners this winter are fantasy fans. Like, if I cared less about diversifying my recommendations, I could have easily filled this entire list with terrific tales of magic and monsters. And the real crazy part is, less than half of those are isekai. Heck, they're not even isekai adjacent. I'm talking fully original stories set in fully original worlds that don't need anyone to get reincarnated or Alice in Wonderlanded or kicked out of their old adventuring party before they get rolling. And there's not an RPG stat screen in sight. The Fire Hunter, for instance, shows us a distant and fantastical future where mankind has finally doused the flames of war, though not by choice. A horrible weapon used in our last great conflict left our entire species susceptible to spontaneous combustion in the presence of even the smallest embers. Thus, to make the gears of industry and civilization turn once again, humanity has been forced to turn to a new source of energy liquid fire. The blood of great and terrible beasts lurking in a dark forest which now blankets much of the earth that can only be harvested by a select group of brave warriors known as fire hunters. When a young girl named Toko foolishly gets one of these hunters killed by wandering into the woods unprotected, it becomes her duty to escort his hunting dog back to the capital. A long and dangerous journey, even in one of the few armored vehicles humanity has left, but one that may well set her on the path to finding Hikari no O, the Firecatcher Lord. A fabled figure who, it is said, will one day harvest the great wandering spark that has circled the Earth since the last war. With a script penned by the Ghost in the Shell goat himself, Mamoru Oshii, and an animation style that I mean, just goddamn look at it. It's a storybook come to life. The Fire Hunter is easily one of the most immersive, enrapturing, and original works of fantasy we've seen come out of the anime industry in ages. And best of all, it's not alone. Giant Beasts of Ars, as its Japanese title Ars no Kyoju subtly suggests, is set in a similar world to that of Shingeki no Kyojin, specifically before the 8 billion twists kick in. A world where humanity must hide her cities behind towering walls in fear of the massive humanoid monstrosities that stalk the lands beyond. Unlike in Attack on Titan, though, our species hasn't quite been pushed to the brink by these one wandering beasts. Thanks to human ingenuity and just a smidge of divine power, granted by clerics and channeled through the blades of mighty warriors known as paladins, people have been able to fend the great beasts off and even hunt them for resources, building enough of a foothold in the process to have nations and trade and politics and whatnot, all of which are presumably complicated by the need to do them around big giant monsters. Also, they've got wars and empires and all that other fun and epic fantasy, but not so much in real life crap, which are also complicated by the presence of giant monsters. Giant Beasts of Ours gets a a lot of stuff really right, right out of the gate, with a strong grasp of character and some solidly tense action scenes. But what really sold me on the show is how rich, vast, and lived in it's able to make this world feel in the space of just 22 minutes all without feeling like it's rushing the main plot along or slowing it down for the sake of exposition. It's just got that sense of capital A adventure about it that defines all my favorite tales of swords and sorcery, with the animation team delivering some capital A action to match. Speaking of, let's take a break from sorcery, but not swords for a sec, to shine a spotlight on winter's most thrilling new work of historical fiction, Revenger. Not to be confused with Tokyo Revengers, which also has a new season this season, out now on Disney Plus for some reason. Also, sorry if that lead-in misled any Vinland Saga fans out there. I promise we will cover both seasons of that in another video very soon. 
Anywho, Raizo Kurima is the last true samurai of the Edo period, so loyal to his lord that even when he discovers his own father-in-law is the one working with the opium smugglers, he doesn't hesitate to bring the criminal down. Which makes it kinda awkward when said lord's opium smuggling hench goons attempt to buy his silence with bullets, but luckily he's rescued by a group of professional revenge takers who need his help to plan a revenge heist on his old boss and eventually hire him on as one of their own, joining them on their ongoing revenge adventures. From there, it's basically the Great Pretender, but instead of conning bad people out of their money, they stab them. Born from the same mind as Madoka Magica and Psychopaths, Revenger represents Gen the Urobucher Urobuchi in his element. Intrigue, melodrama, and buckets of blood. Which is always at least a good foundation for an anime, and probably more than that as long as he's actually writing it himself. And as for how that foundation is built upon, well, I think the action and direction in Revenger really speak for themselves, stylistically speaking. And given the rarely explored period it's set in, the last days of the samurai, when their descendants grew fat suckling at the teats of western empires and began work on an empire of their own, one built in part on the back of the opium trade, fun fact, there should be plenty of substance to back that style up. Whether you look for cool, dumb sword fights or cool, smart historical narratives in your samurai media, Revenger is shaping up to be the complete Kurosawa package. Okay, sounds neat, but what if you want to flip it around and enjoy some sorcery without the swords? Well, High Card, a new original anime born from the mind of Kakegurui's Homura Kawamoto, has you covered in style. At first blush, High Card's world, the Kingdom of Forland, seems much like our own, only a little more Vegasy, or Monte Carlo-y, depending on the region you're in. Regardless, it's a land of fast, fancy cars and bright neon lights, with all the weapons and tech that exists in our own world, but one key difference to make things interesting. Or, uh, 52 key differences, depending on how you look at it. X playing cards. Powerful artifacts which grant their holders unique magical abilities, ranging from unlimited uncanny luck to summoning a gun to turning everything they touch to marbles. That last one is much much scarier than it sounds. Our hero, a streetwise young pickpocket named Finn, gets sucked into this world of X-card players when his plan to save the orphanage by winning big at the casino goes very, very wrong. But as the newest member of High Card, an elite group of extremely handsome secret agents masquerading as luxury car salesmen and tasked by the king with recovering the scattered cards to restore order to the world, he might just be able to keep a roof over those kids' heads. That is, if he can hang on to his own head as they do battle with the super-powered soldiers of rival car companies and the mafia. High Card is one of those anime that just oozes fun out of every frame, and a perfect example of what fantasy anime can be when it's not afraid to break the mold. Don't think Isekai is just lying down and taking it this season, though, because I've got a pair of equally fun and relatively original portal fantasies to recommend to you today. The first of which, Campfire Cooking in Another World with My Absurd Skill, is perfect for when you want to lie down and take it easy. Summoned to another world on accident alongside the actual trio of destined Demon King defeaters, it initially seems like Mukoto Suyoshi has gotten the short end of the cheatability stick. I mean, next to Divine Magic and the power of the hero, Net Super sounds pretty darn lame if we're being honest, but if you think about it for even a second, the ability to exchange fantasy money for anything one might find in a typical modern Japanese online supermarket is way more useful than any of that crap when it comes to day-to-day -day life in a medieval world, and it leaves you with zero obligation to fight any demons or save that world. Assuming that even is the hero's real job and the corpulent, jewel-encrusted monarch who summoned them isn't just using them as political 
political pawns to enrich his own kingdom, which it super duper seems like he is. So just to be safe, as soon as he's out of the castle, Mukota makes a beeline for the nearest border before it closes. The first step in a long and lackadaisical journey that's sure to be interrupted with countless shots of unfathomably succulent anime food porn and filled end-to-end -end with cozy JRPG hangout vibes. Relaxing, funny, and thoroughly wholesome with a surprisingly sharp mind for politics on its shoulders. Even when it comes to isekai, fantasy fans are eating this winter in more ways than one. But my favorite new flavor of this season, the magical revolution of the reincarnated princess and the genius young lady, has all that and more, including a genuinely original, seriously clever premise, and I don't just mean for an isekai. It doesn't even let on that it is an isekai at first, instead trusting its audience to figure it out from how the characters interact. Reincarnated into a world of wonder from her old life as a fantasy-loving otaku, yet denied her dream of flight as the one member of the royal family who doesn't have an ounce of magical talent, the brave and brash Princess Anisphia finds another way, leveraging her knowledge of modern earthly science in in conjunction with her family's vast magical resources, she's able to develop a new field of study called magicology, which has the potential to bring power to the people like this world has never seen before. But that potential is only realized when her life becomes intertwined with Euphelia Magenta, a magically gifted genius debutante who was betrothed to her brother, Prince Algard, before he tried to frame her for several days different crimes and call off their marriage so he can hook up with the commoner. Just like one of my Japanese otomes, which really sucks for Euphelia, but ultimately only frees her up to lend her incredible magical mind and reputation to Anasphia's world-shaken research. And also to, I mean, you can see how these girls are blushing at each other. I, I don't gotta tell you what kind of anime this is. Honestly though, it's the magic science shit that I'm here for. And if this animation team can keep delivering those incredible Sakuga payoffs to Euphelia and Anasphia's magic inventing and adventuring, I think I'll be here for 12 straight episodes, pretty much no matter what the rest of the anime does. I do hope that their revolution also involves changing this stuffy aristocratic society minds about girls kissing and getting married and stuff though because they're nice kids and they deserve the best as do you which is why i just gave it to you those were the ones to watch for winter 2023 but as usual they're not the only shows worth watching this season if you don't mind a few minor defects, so let's go rooting through the bargain bin. If you have any kind of passion for great animation and also a very, 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 very strong tolerance for anime bullshit, Onimai, the story of a 20-something otaku shut-in whose super scientist sister turns him into a middle school girl to cure his depression, is easily one of the most uniquely gorgeous anime I've ever seen. And the story is actually super wholesome too, once you get past all the bullshit. Just be forewarned, there's a lot of bullshit. On the flip side, if you want something bullshit-free and don't mind some rough edges to the animation production, Epon again portrays an all-girls high school judo club with some remarkably naturalistic dialogue. That's also a quality I was surprised to find in Unite Up. I'm not normally into male idol anime at all, but this one has an invigorating believe-in-yourself sort of shonen sports vibe about it that goes a long way to offset all the male idoliness and actually got my blood pumping in a few places. Or, if you're sick of shows about teenagers and want something more adult, the ice guy and his cool colleague offers mature workplace romance in the vein of Wodakoi with a fun, fantastical twist. Speaking of, as I said earlier, quite a few great fantasy anime just barely missed the cut this winter, including Kaina of the Great Snow Sea, an original story from Polygon Pictures reminiscent of Miyazaki Nausicaa, with some of the most breathtaking and imaginative environments you'll see all year. 
Then there's Sugar Apple Fairy Tale, the story of a young and naive wannabe candy chef trying to navigate a dark and surprisingly dangerous world where fairies have been enslaved by mankind. By a similar token, Tale of Outcasts follows a Victorian orphan who's saved from a short life of torture and servitude by an unusually friendly demon. On the isekai front, Handyman Saito in Another World is a charming, character-driven RPG parody comedy with an earthy, painterly art style that feels distinctly Tolkien-esque. Farming Life in Another World is basically one of those anime where a guy works himself to death and gets to live in Dragon Quest as a reward, only replace Dragon Quest with Rune Factory. And Endo and Kobayashi Live, the latest on tsundere villainess Lisa Lot, features one of the most unique and clever framing devices I've seen in an isekai. Two friends discover that the main love interest in their favorite fantasy dating sim can somehow hear their let's play commentary on the game's story, allowing them to change that story through him in order to save the doomed villainous who is both of their favorite character. As for I can't believe it's not Isekai anime, Reborn to Master the Blade, from Hero King to Extraordinary Squire, is similar to a lot of other anime with similar titles, and with the misfit at Demon King Academy back, I'm not exactly excited for it. Plus, it features, on the whole, way too much exposition but I'll be damned if the action scenes, at least, don't fully live up to that title. On that note, Nier Automata version 1.1a adapts the game of the same name into some of the most breathtakingly beautiful action sakuga out there. Nier fans will definitely love this anime, but unfortunately, with the way it's paced and structured, if you're not a fan already, it gives you very little reason to start caring about the game's world or characters and its use of in-game models for CGI looks just plain ugly. Last and also least, I'm not gonna pretend like Technoroid Overmind, a show about four android roommates who decide to become male idols to pay the rent is good on any level, but you should watch the first episode all the way through to the post credit scene anyway, preferably with a lot of friends and or alcohol. It is something else, I'll tell you what. Okay, with that, we've really reached the end. I hope these recommendations have made your winter just that little bit brighter. If they did and you want to thank me for my service, remember you've got till February 3rd at noon PST to pre-order my U2s at the link below. Or if you want to make your winter a little darker instead, don't forget to check out my rundown of the worst anime of 2022 if you haven't seen it already. I'm Jeff Thu, your humble guide to anime, wishing you the best in this new year.